You are listening to the Forcecom Frontline, bringing you to our soldiers on the front lines of readiness. Hey everyone, welcome to the Forcecom Frontline. I'm Ashley and I'm your host. September is Suicide Prevention Month and every year we try to have at least one episode during September that really focuses on this topic. And there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on in the Army with suicide prevention um, and trying to reduce the number of suicides in the Army. So here to talk with me today is Miss Carrie Scholl and she is a Suicide Prevention Program Manager in the Army's G9. Hi Carrie, thank you for taking time out to talk with me. Hi, Ashley. Thank you for having me. All right. So like I said in the intro, September is Suicide Prevention Month. Um, There's a lot of things going on with regards to suicide prevention within the Army. Can you just give us a broad picture of some of the things, the big things, and then we can break that down a little bit more as we go in our conversation? Sure. So Suicide Prevention Month, as you said, is coming up. Um, So from our headquarters perspective, we have done a couple of things. One, we have a specific Army theme that we do for Suicide Prevention Month. It nests with our DOD theme. So the DOD theme is Connect to Protect, Support is in Within Reach. This year, we did something really special. We did a crowdsourcing event because we wanted to really get some input and feedback from the field. Um, And so we did that and we selected uh, the winner. And the Army theme is Be the Light in Someone's Life. And so it really, it is such a wonderful nesting with the DOD strategy. And then we developed some phenomenal materials that are available on our Army website, the armyresilience.army.mil. And they really focus on the light theme. So whether you're a beacon of light or whether you're shining a light on helping resources. So it uh, it was a really great way to kind of focus our efforts with those communication materials. Yeah. We've also we've also got some um, we're doing some public service announcements with our senior leaders, um, and they're also going to support um, uh, a couple of uh, high level events that are happening here at the Pentagon. So on the sixth of September, we are going to recognize the Army winners of last year's Suicide Prevention Month. So um, and in addition to all of the other the DoD winners, so um, we'll have our Army leadership engaged there, and then we'll also promote um, uh, some more Suicide Prevention Month uh, information, again, that way. Okay. And so the Army just released, and I, maybe that's not the right word, but the Army Suicide Prevention Program, and it's the service's first standalone guidance of its kind. So can you talk about why the Army decided to do this for suicide prevention and what and what the program says? Absolutely. So, you know, we've we've had a couple of um, inspections and we've heard from the field um, previously, not a lot of awareness of the suicide prevention policy. It was currently part of a larger policy. And so um, we decided that, you know, we needed to really have its, it have its own voice. So we created the standalone policy. And at the same time, we really looked at it as part of the larger prevention strategy that we're working for, again, on on multiple harmful behaviors. And so suicide prevention is the first one out of of the shoot, if you will, um, focusing on really a public health approach. Um, Our three functions of the program, which are prevention, intervention, and postvention, and really nesting with our civilian um, strategies from the CDC as well as from the White House. Okay. And so one of the things you just said, um, the regulation increases the Army's focus on primary prevention by codifying a public health approach that is based on the CDC's suicide prevention guidance. And can you you explain what public health approach means? I mean, I, I feel like that it sounds broad. Absolutely. Yes. So a a public health approach is really looking at, if you will, the the influencers on that individual making prevention decisions. So in the past, our program has been very focused on the individual. And with our public health approach, we're really looking at the risk and protective factors across multiple levels. In technical terms, it's the socio-ecological model, um, but that really, it looks at, so at an individual, my risk and protective factors, but it also looks at that next level. So my interpersonal, 
your families, your friends, your peers, and kind of how they are supportive or potentially not of your prevention activities. That next level out, the unit, and then the community, and then of course the larger society. So recognizing that all those things influence the individual and we really need to understand um, each of the different levels and how we need to better um, pose that poise them for prevention. Okay. It's, you know, suicide's one of those things that I feel like every time I, I start to talk about it, you're like, oh, I just wish I could help everybody. You know, like what makes that person feel like ending their life is better than, than you know, being. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know. Um, it's just, it's one of those things where you just wish that you could, you could change the world. <laughs> Absolutely. It, every suicide is so heartbreaking. Um, yeah, you know, it really is. And, and um, no matter how, you know, matter, no matter what, where you are, every time you read about it, 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 it truly, it breaks my heart. And, and that, you know, we, we really are dedicated to preventing every suicide. We want to have our attitude of prevention, yeah. the belief that we're the things that we're putting in place, uh, we'll save a life. Yeah. I am. Um, so my family actually dealt with a suicide earlier this year, my cousin. Um, and you know, one of the th first things my mom said to me was, you know, it, it seems so selfish. And I was like, based on everything that I've just been, I've been doing and hearing with, with suicide and, and my sm very, very small role. Um, it, it, I, I felt like I had to almost explain to her, you know, that that's not, that's not what this person felt. They weren't, they weren't being selfish. This was more of a, you know, let me take the burden off of everybody else. Um, but it, it's a hard thing to, to grapple with, honestly. I mean, to, to know that somebody gets to that point. It really is. It, it is. And, and, you know, the, those that are the survivors, you know, yeah. the family, the friends, you know, they're, we're all trying to understand why, because, right. you know, we, we all, you know, we, we don't want that person to die by suicide. All right. So, you know, talking about the suicide prevention policy, it establishes ask care escort as the army's premier suicide prevention training. And correct me if I'm wrong, but ACE has been around for a little bit. If I'm correct, I think I'm correct. Um, so what has changed and what's been added? Yeah, we have really worked hard to modernize our suicide prevention program, you know, for, it's been stagnant, um, for, for many years and, and for reasons, you know, that, that were done before, before I came on board. Um, but, uh, you know, our chief of training has, has been working really hard to use are the best evidence, which is what everyone knows, right? Not death by PowerPoint, <laughs> but, but especially for suicide prevention, like small group and discussion based, or we can really get at the heart of building, building some skills and understanding how to build confidence and capability, right? The, 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 the ability to then take the knowledge and actually then use it yeah. and use it not only at the point of crisis. So if someone has a suicide ideation, um, you know, but beforehand, maybe someone is, is struggling in a relationship. Maybe they're struggling with some work stress. They're struggling with their finances. So, hey, how can we get you to a financial counselor? How can we maybe do some, you know, we've got these great resilience centers mm -hmm. and they can do some emotional uh, regulation type of training for that might help with your relationship. Or we've got, you know, lots of different resources, but so earlier, and as well as maybe it is at the point of crisis, maybe it is at the point where someone says, you know, I, I'm just, I'm in a real dark place. Oh, well, let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's that, you know, let, let me, let me feel that I can say something and help this person. I feel like that's the hardest part because you're, you're, putting yourself in a situation where you're being vulnerable as well as asking this person this very personal question what what is going on are you going to hurt yourself and that takes a lot of courage 
It does. It absolutely takes a lot of courage, A, like you said, to be vulnerable, to, yeah. you know, we show the best of ourselves. Um, and so it's really, you know, sometimes it is at that, you know, when we're really struggling that we, we only then we may admit it because we're trying to deal with it ourselves, sure. you know, we're, um, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's it. I think the challenge is we don't want it to seem like it's anyone's fault mm -hmm. if they didn't notice anything, right? Because right. because we are really good at um, absolutely at kind of like trying to try to do it on our own and hiding it. I think I think people are very good at putting on a smile in one situation, but you know then they go back to home or you know the barracks by themselves, and and it's somebody completely different that sort of comes out. Um, and I think also too, we're always told like to mind your own business, <laughs> like, you know, like, especially when it comes to this sort of deeper conversation, um, unless somebody wants you to come in just back off a little bit. And so again, it goes back to being vulnerable and looking out for each other and knowing when, when to speak up and say something. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, I think there's a lot of stigma about reaching out, right? Like, yeah. is it going to impact my career? Is this, you know, this is how I'm paying my bills. Th these are the things that Absolutely. I have. And so, um, you know, this g being able to feel um, psychologically safe, you know, I know it's, that might sound like a catchphrase, <laughs> but it really is being able to feel safe that, hey, I'm going to share something with you and, like, how, yeah. how can we do this that it's not going to ultimately um, harm me in the, in the long run? Right. And so, in, and that's the sort of stuff that's being talked about in, in the ACE training. Yeah. So those are the discussions that, that we want to build the, the, in the, like the ask question. So working really on like some active listening skills. How do I, how do I, how do I get someone to open up? Um, and not show judgment, right? Yeah. When I'm listening to them. Um, and then being able to take that information and say, okay, well, you know, how can I then show care and compassion? And that might mean just knowing what resources are out there, building that trust, being able to, to um, again, have a conversation, a difficult conversation, yeah. um, and build trust while you're having that conversation to, to get to what, whatever that point is. If it's crisis intervention, if it's, hey, we need to call 988, the crisis line, um, or hey, can we call can we call someone, behavioral health, the chaplain, the military family life consists, right. my, my, my friend, yeah. how, do we, how do we take care of this? And I think too, you know, we talk about building trust. That's something that needs to be worked on day to day. That's not something that, that you wait till there's a crisis actually happening. Um, that that's a culture that needs to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, what's the word? <laughs> it needs to be promoted. It needs to be, yes. you know, something that's happening all of the time, not just, you know, when a crisis comes around, you know, we've talked a lot about the army suicide prevention program, the ask care escort, the wellness checks, um, lethal means safety, but is there anything else happening um, or anything else that we haven't talked about that you want to touch on? Yeah. Thank, thanks for asking that. I think, um, you know, I think, you know, we've talked about prevention. Uh, we've talked about intervention. I think the one thing I would also just, if I can talk about postvention. Um, and so these, this is really the structured activities that, um, that happen after there is a suicide. Um, and we often think of postvention as, as really a response. Um, and it's intended to kind of act as a prevention piece. So um, it's really to help the unit grieve and, and then reintegrate after there's a death. And so we have published some, some guidance to help leaders really through this, um, this time. And, and we, and we've done that because, um, fortunately, you know, suicides, not, not every commander will have a suicide. Sure. Um, and so, um, our resources are there to help walk through them. You know, our personnel are trained that they can help those commanders as they need to walk through, through these steps, 
um, that are really um, aimed at prevention. And, and that's really what all of our resources are to do is to really help commanders um, with additional guidance and resources um, navigate the, the suicide prevention program. So before we let you go, <laughs> let's talk about security clearances. And we actually did an entire podcast episode on security clearances and behavioral health and the fact that you will not, in fact, lose your security clearance because you seek behavioral health. But let's talk a little bit more. No, I, I you know, I think there's a when we talk about stigma for seeking help, you know, we hear that constantly now, Absolutely. you know, there's a it's a true barrier. There is this this grand mythology out there. And so we have got to bust this myth yes. that seeking behavioral health is going to impact your career. Um, the numbers that, you know, when we say, hey, we're, you know, we're a numbers driven business, the numbers are so, so, so small and, and minuscule. Um, it, it's it's such a rarity. Yeah. Um, and so really want to encourage, you know, people to go seek behavioral health, seek counseling. Uh, it's it's going to be helpful and better in the long run. You know, it's just nice to go talk to somebody sometimes and have them validate how you feel. I mean, <laughs> to just put it out there. I mean, it, it can be really nice to just have somebody listen to you and walk out of that room and say, well, I guess I guess my feelings aren't so crazy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's just from my own personal experience. So I, I put that out there for everybody as a little bit of a, a grain of salt that um, you don't know what you don't know. And if you, you know, just take take a step, take a leap of faith and go talk to somebody, you, you might feel a lot better. Absolutely. <laughs> so Again, Carrie, thank you so much for sticking with me through this chaos of this interview. I appreciate it. Um, I think this is a really important topic. September is a really important month for us to really talk about suicide prevention, and the Army is doing a ton. Um, I, I Again, I appreciate you, and thank you for being here. No, thank you so much for, for doing this. And uh, you have got strong resilience. I, you've got a lot of adaptability in you through all the technicals. So um, I'm very impressed. Oh, thank you. <laughs>